Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, nice to meet you. Meet you, Dr. Stein. How are you doing? Very well. How about you? We're hanging in there. Yeah, under the circumstances. I don't know how anybody's doing well. <clears throat> yeah, it's it is a struggle. You know, we've gone through the Gulf War, uh 9-11, another Gulf War, Trump, and now this. I, I think this is the worst it's ever been. I think so. I feel like we're on a death watch right now for two million people, and it's absolutely yeah. agonizing. And and I feel like we're losing our democracy just so that some people can support the war, not not the war, the genocide. Yes, absolutely. And this is the the flip side of you know of of an empire, of an empire that. Uh, impoverishes us at home and suppresses our democracy and delivers a militarized police state is really what we're dealing with now. You know, World War I, World War II happened. You go to these World War memorials in Washington, D.C., where it says, we did not come here to conquer, we came here to liberate. And uh, it's words like that that just are empty these days. When did When did America turn from a liberating force to a to an empire to an imperial force i think it goes way ba way back i mean um i certainly became aware of it uh in the war in vietnam and that was kind of my my wake up call but certainly you know i don't know american history well enough going way back to say when it started but you know that was um you know that was part of what was valuable in the founding fathers warnings against becoming uh you know embroiled in the easy conquest outside of the vigilance of you know a, of a democracy because once you're outside of the borders there's just room for all sorts of abuse and if you don't have a really you know uh responsible uh press there is no watchdogging this. And, you know, certainly for a long time, we've had a, a increasingly a lapdog press instead of a watchdog press. And, um, you know, certainly since 9-11, but it preceded 9-11, it was really well enforced. You know, you can look at the uh, conquests of the CIA starting after the Second World War, when our government through our so-called security agencies, especially the CIA, got into the business of overturning secretly other uh, other sovereign nations and especially democracies that were progressive. You know, Iran in uh, with a democratically elected president in the 1950s, Guatemala, where a democratically elected socialist. Uh, president was overturned because he was redistributing land and United Fruit didn't like it. You know, and Iran, the issue was uh, oil and the desire of BP and the U.S. to maintain their hegemony over oil. You know, Ronald Reagan himself declared Israel in uh, the 1980s to be the unsinkable battleship for the U.S. in the Middle East. And, you know, in the in the early 1990s, after the breakup of the so breakup of the Soviet Union, the U.S. declared a foreign policy uh, and, and named it uh, full spectrum dominance, meaning that the U.S. would dominate all regions of the globe in all potential realms of conflict, whether they were military or economic, cyberspace, outer space under the sea. We are dedicated, uh, and I don't mean we, I mean our uh, illegitimate and, and criminal imperial government is dedicated to maintaining its status as the sole ruling force around the world. It certainly was following the Second World War, but it is no longer. So we are engaged, our misleaders have engaged us in a series of catastrophic wars, um, you know, and that was certainly evident going all the way back to uh, uh, the, the war in Vietnam, but more recently in uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, in Libya. You know, these are utter disastrous wars that cost the American people 
you know, trillions upon trillions of dollars, 21 trillion to be specific, since uh, the 9-11 wars began, and result in the horrific deaths, you know, effectively genocide after genocide. Uh, in Vietnam, it was 3 million needless uh, deaths of brown-skinned people. And in, you know, starting in Iraq, it was a million people who were killed. And now the uh, Cost of War Project um, out of Brown University, which is certainly not a radical think tank, you know, they've come up with at least 4 million, some say 6 million who've been killed uh, starting in uh, in the war in Iraq and subsequently. And what have we done? You know, what, what has been accomplished with that? Failed states, mass refugee migrations, continuing terrorist threats, but lots of payola, you know, for the, uh, the, the war profiteering industry, which together with APAC and the fossil fuel industry that also benefits uh, and Wall Street, you know, enormous profits for the industries that have everything to gain in these wars, while people around the world are the victims. And we here in the US are both impoverished and I would say we are endangered as well, because in this day and age, as nuclear weapons continue to proliferate, um, these 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 wars are definitely, you know, at, at the nuclear brink. Whether you're looking at uh, Ukraine or uh, at uh, Israel and U.S.'s war on Gaza, which is rapidly becoming, you know, a much bigger war uh, in the Middle East. And Israel's efforts to engage Iran in this war to distract from its genocide and to embroil the U.S. in a horrific war. This could easily bring in Russia, which is, uh, you know, uh, has an alliance with Iran. This could easily go nuclear, as several other U.S. wars could. So, you know, for me, this is really kind of a central theme in what needs to be done to. Uh, you know, to have a livable future, let alone to reestablish a democracy that uh, is really on life support right now. These problems of, you know, the climate collapse, endless wars verging on nuclear, human rights, rights abuses, and outright genocide, um, and the assault on democracy, they are really interwoven. The good thing, though, in this picture, to my mind, is that the American people have really woken up now in large numbers. Not, not so for our elected misleaders who, in large numbers, are just staying the course in this horrific uh, genocide and the many other wars that the U.S. is engaged in, and the military budget, which is robbing us blind, consuming half of our discretionary budget. So, you know, to my mind, the battle is all about getting to the microphone. The battle is all about engaging uh, the public discussion because the American people are already on our side. They already get it. You know, in, in uh, New York, uh, the Democratic primary held, what, four or five weeks ago, there was an amazing 12% uncommitted, but there was also an amazing 83% that would not come out and vote. So, you know, the American people are fed up and have been clamoring for other options. What's very difficult is putting those options front and center in this election. And there's a whole system you have to fight in order to inject this genocide and the endless war machine into that debate and discussion. Our campaign, as you may know, is uh, the only anti-war, anti-genocide, pro-worker campaign on track right now. We already have 75% of the total burden of signature collection done. We're now struggling with uh, what we call the empire's last stand, which is in New York state, where they've pulled out all the stops, all the dirty tricks imaginable, beginning with their, um, uh, their covert uh, poison pill change in the rules, tripling the number of signatures required, which is a scam to start with, the idea that we have to go to such extraordinary lengths to have people-powered political choices. We have the usual Wall Street and war machine choices that are rammed down our throats. This election, more than any other, people are ready to throw off 
those chains, but they need to know that there are other options. Unfortunately, we see some people thinking that the solution to Biden's genocide is Trump. It's definitely not. You know, we do have an option, um, you know, and, and I would not rule out the potential to even win the office. And let me say, I think you can win the day even without winning the office by mounting a very strong challenge. And you can you can force the hand of the president who could stop this genocide in the blink of an eye. If he knows that we're on the ballot in New York, uh, that is a real shot across his bow. And he needs to get that threat right now that could move him, it could move other Democrats, but I would leave nothing to chance. And I would really aim for the stars here because we are in a perfect storm. And as Frederick Douglass said, the famous abolitionist, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. We have to bring that demand into uh, political discourse. And if we do, all bets are off because there are three pro-war, pro-genocide candidates on the ballot. It is possible they could split the pro-war vote themselves. And because we are the only option for healthcare as a human right, for actually ending student debt, making public higher education free, um, for creating uh, you know, millions of jobs through a Green New Deal to address the climate crisis, because we address so many major demographics who otherwise don't have a fighting chance, there is a real potential once we break the sound barrier to compete in a four-way race where, where you can win in a four-way race with as little as 26% of the vote. So it is not impossible. Bernie Sanders himself percolated along at two to 3% until he was sort of broke, broke through uh, fairly well along into the primary. So I would really encourage people not to be discouraged by the propaganda of the war machine that is doing everything it possibly can to silence us because it is terrified that a breakthrough is actually in the works right now. Well, you know, you mentioned uh, the the work on uh, against the Vietnam Vietnam War. Uh, people have made parallels with the, the protests today. However, there's no draft today. Uh, I think in terms of the 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 genocide, it's still not the top five. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on terms of issues that are important to voters. Uh, however, uh, one striking similarity is that in 1968, the Democratic National Convention was in Chicago. Uh, it's in Chicago again. It's going to be a hot summer day in Chicago in late August. What do you expect from that, those events there, um, how Biden will come out? Because um, it will, it, there will definitely be some challenges. There will definitely be protests. Um, and if he's bruised, he may not be uh, that viable candidate that they're trying to prop him uh, up to be. Uh, what do you expect uh, during that, that convention? I certainly expect there to be turmoil and the turmoil that's evident on campuses right now. I don't think that's going away. Um, you know, the Democrats themselves are terrified because they've now basically called off a actual in-person convention, and they're now talking about during, doing a virtual convention. But in addition, if you look at the polls, the polls are disastrous. Uh, this poll that came out yesterday. Excuse me, yeah, know, just sorry to interrupt, but how can you have a candidate that never talks to Pete, to real people in turn, in the, on the campaign trail? If it's only done virtually, how do they expect to win? Well, I think that's how out of touch they are. They are completely out of touch. The fact that they have shut down any even challenge within the Democratic Party, I think their whole approach here has been one that's extremely authoritarian, one that's anti-democratic, one that really um, uh, alarms and alienates the American public. So now you have um, substantial portions of African-Americans, majorities of Hispanics, you know, and of course, the Arab American population, I don't know the numbers from that, but I can imagine they're off the charts. And in uh, uh, among Hispanics, the majority now are supporting Trump, not because they like Trump, but because they're just horrified by uh, what Biden has delivered, Biden and the Democrats who make all sorts of false promises 
and then break them. So, you know, that's even worse than not making promises at all. But I want to just comment also about the other issues, which are number one, because we are aligned on those issues. You know, those issues are that people need health care. People need uh, to get out of debt. People need to deal with inflation. And, you know, Bidenomics is good if you're in the top couple of percent. If you're a big investor, you're doing very well with Bidenomics, but it's otherwise not. And, you know, inflation is still a horrific problem. 60 some percent of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck right now. You have half of renters who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads. So, you know, these issues of economic justice. Uh, and of workers' struggles for the right to even have a union for a living wage, promises that uh, Biden and the Democrats, even the progressive Democrats, completely abandoned. They were, um, you know, they voted to inflict that uh, contract that had been rejected by the railroad workers and forced very unsafe and just, you know, uh, uh, horrific condition, working conditions on them where they're basically on call all the time. They're working horrific hours and you have two or three people who are responsible for these trains that are two and three miles long. So what happened in East Palestine was absolutely predictable and preventable, but you had the Democrats basically, you know, leading the way on this just abuse of American labor. So I would not take the uh, propaganda at face value. The fact that um, that opposition to genocide doesn't rank number one, well, that's okay because opposition to genocide, who is that? You know, Well, that's first of all, that's the majority of the American people. It's also the majority of the American people who are hurting for a good living wage, 20 to $25 an hour is what the American people need. They also need rent control. They need uh, uh, so-called social housing, which is affordable. They need more housing to be built. They need a, a, a renters, a tenants bill of rights. You know, you have more uh, people now who are homeless than ever on record. And, you know, the numbers of children who are in poverty now has basically doubled in recent years. So you have this really extreme economic crushing economic inequality right now, but that goes hand in hand. And I just want to also make one other comment about there not being a draft. There's a different kind of draft now. It's like your life draft. You're not being drafted into the army, but your life is really very much at risk. And polls of young people now show that uh, half of people age 25 and under half are uh, describe themselves as hopeless about the future. You know, that's kind of like having another draft. It's like a reality draft. And then looking further, one quarter of all young people now are so hopeless about the future, they have contemplated doing harm to themselves within two weeks of the poll. What does that tell you? You know, that really tells you that while we don't have a specific draft, people are that hopeless that their lives have really been put on the line by a system which is broadly abusing them. So, you know, it feels to me like it really is a perfect storm, but what it requires to do this is breaking through the sound barrier. And there are two ways, two necessary steps one is that we have to be on the ballot in New York, and we have two weeks to complete that ballot drive. We're doing well. We have a number you know, of um, professional supporters that we have contracted. We should have all the signatures we need, but the system is designed to fly blind. You can't know where you are until it's too late to do anything about it. So you have to really err on the safe side. And we're encouraging everyone who can pick up a, a petition in New York to help us and gather 100 signatures. And let's make sure that we have that margin of safety because if we make it in New York, we're virtually unstoppable. And then the media is gonna have to start covering us. They've been hiding behind this uh, this mythology that there are several progressive candidates and, oh, they can't figure out which one is going to be in the lead. Well, unfortunately, all you have to do is look at a map of who's on the ballot and you will see that there is one campaign that is actually well on the way, already has ballot status in the big, difficult and expensive states. And we're well on the way to uh, 
raking in all the other ballot lines. So that is the way it's going to sort out. But that has been used. The un, the, the several progressive candidates have been used uh, as an excuse by the mainstream media not to cover us because the mainstream media is terrified. They are quaking in their boots that there is going to be a major breakthrough here to create an America and a world that works for all of us. And that means starting with an end to genocide and the genocidal war on Gaza right now. Uh, do you remember David Broder? Yes, I, I certainly remember the name and I remember I remember his face. The Washington Post. Okay. Um, he he said one thing that I will never forget. He said, the First Amendment is not just about separation of church and state. It's also the separation of media and the state, so calling mm -hmm. for a free press. Great. And yeah. the compromise that we have accepted that you have now, the media is basically bringing government spokespeople as quote unquote national security experts uh, as if they're telling us what it means to be secure, um, yet everything they've done has has done just the opposite. It it's eroded our security. Um, so a lot of the problem comes with this term national security. National security was invoked uh, during the Iraq War. I remember they said this is for our national security, supporting Israel against uh, the Palestinians. It's about national security, uh, interning Japanese Americans was done in the name of national security. Well, there's something called human security, which uh, which uh, points to freedom of, of speech, freedom uh, of, of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. How do we change the conversation on security for our country? Because that's what gets a lot of people um, uh, latched onto or, or not trapped, but you know what I mean. They, ho they, they hook onto that and say, well, I don't know anything about national security. They must know more than I do. And therefore, I'm just going to go along with it. That is exactly why opposition politics is so critical, because otherwise you have political elites who basically engineer a conversation, uh, which is largely propaganda. And it requires a challenge. You know, that's, again, the words of Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. That is the role of a true opposition party. Right now you have the Democrats and Republicans and they have pretty much the same foreign policy stance, you know, with, with, with very few exceptions. You can count them practically on one hand. They're basically all war all the time. They have not seen a war that they didn't love uh, really for decades. And you know, uh, I would I would basically maintain that what they do in a whole realm of policies, including health care and immigrant rights, um, education, they are not solving the problem, you know, and the differences between them are largely window dressing. And we're seeing a system which is really in collapse. If you talk to everyday working people, their lives are in collapse, whatever dimension you're looking at. So in my view, the question is all about breaking through the uh, the silence that's imposed on this discussion. And I've always found in my political experience, and I have been uh, raging against the machine for quite some time, when you get to the microphone, they are terrified and they will do all that they can to keep you from getting to the microphone. And then when you do get to the microphone, they will create all kinds of propaganda campaigns and smear campaigns to try to knock people off course. But you know, we've been here and we've done that and they've kind of used all the smears against me that they could possibly dig up. I don't think they're gonna come up with new things. And I think they are terrified you know, that we should break through. And to my mind, that's the name of the game because the minute we have broken through, the minute we start getting covered by mainstream media, even if they are attacking us, that's okay because most people have learned you can't trust mainstream media. In fact, the polls now show that over half of the American public presume rightfully that mainstream media is lying to them and purposefully misleading them, which is actually true. Uh, much of the time, perhaps even most of the time. So to my mind, you don't have to convince the predators. They're going to keep doing their job, which is to basically serve their big corporate sponsors, you know, APAC and the war industry and, and Wall Street. 
those are their corporate masters they will continue to serve. Our job is to assert democracy and to fight our way into this battle so that it can be heard. Because our message, you can be sure, resonates far and wide, not only about the horror of this genocide, but also the fact that our endless war machine is impoverishing us and it's endangering us. Nuclear conflict anywhere is a horrific danger. And when the American people are reminded of that, they get it because one nuclear armed submarine carries the equivalent of 5,000 Hiroshima bombs, which is enough to put us into serious nuclear winter. And the US has 14 such nuclear armed submarines. You know, So this is a, a series of disasters in the making that, that are clueless, misleaders are just plunging headlong into. And when the American people are reminded of that, they want to pull back from the brink. They also want to be spending our billions of dollars, which Congress will and, and Biden will come up with in the blink of an eye, you know, this latest package, 26 billion for Israel, 61 billion for more death and disaster for the people of Ukraine. You know, it's outrageous while we have tens of millions of people who don't have health care, half of renters who are just barely hanging onto a roof over their heads. So, you know, we have everything in our favor right now. Um, unfortunately, you know, most Americans are in crisis as well right now. And that crisis is rapidly getting worse. It's not getting better in any way. And, you know, all these crises are converging and they could turn in such a big way if we began to spend our security dollars in a way that actually makes the American people secure and we stop driving, you know, this genocidal war and others that are really in the making. As we sometimes say, you know, what goes down in Gaza doesn't stay in Gaza. This is about normalizing uh, the torture of children and the murder on an industrial scale of children and families. And if we turn a blind eye to this, you know, we are basically giving the thumbs up for this to continue to be an increasing disaster around the world. The US has been top dog for the past many decades, but we're not going to be top dog. In fact, we're no longer top dog. If you just look at the uh, global GDP, we've been overtaken by China and the, and the BRICS nations, you know, uh, India, South Africa, uh, uh, Brazil, Russia, and India. They have surpassed us now in the GDP. So anyone who thinks that we are we have this nice secure position as top dog needs to think again. So for the sake of our own survival here, we need to get with the program here and start supporting international law. It's not just the lives of Gazans, the lives of, of Israelis and the lives of people throughout the Middle East. It's really lives all around the world and it is the future of international law, human rights, um, and just, you know, peace and security across the board. So we can have a win-win here if we stand up with the courage of our convictions. And whether we win the White House or we simply win the day by establishing a very strong movement that's no longer going to be silenced, that will not submerge ourselves within a so-called lesser evil vote. And by the way, good luck figuring out which one is the lesser evil when it's you know the former lesser evil who's now leading the charge for genocide and censorship and the police state, which is coming in and cracking heads you know in in our in our campuses against peaceful protests. You know, I think we got. We got two greater evil candidates right now, and we need to forget the lesser evil and start fighting for the greater good like our lives depend on it, because, in fact, they do. Yeah, we have definitely abandoned human rights and international humanitarian law. Uh, you mentioned the Brown report uh, on Iraq. Uh, it also reported that between 500 and 800,000 Iraqi children under the age of five were killed uh during or between the two uh gulf wars uh, some thirty thousand american veterans have committed suicide uh since the gulf war uh so as you said th there's a tremendous financial and human cost to us as americans and to people all around the world uh american credibility is sinking uh so i i i believe that the protests are really intended 
intended to change the course for the betterment and for the, for the best interests of, of our nation. Uh, the First Amendment also says that Congress shall not uh, abridge the, uh, the, the right to petition the government or, or uh, redress uh, of grievances, which is exactly what the protests are about. We have no, we have no space in the Congress to discuss these issues. We have no space in the national security team to discuss these issues. So now the students are taking it upon themselves to uh, petition the government through the protest and they are peaceful. I've been, I was at four encampments. You were at, at many of them. Um, and I met Jews uh, like yourself who are part of the protests and they're calling this anti-Semitic and these, these encampments were very peaceful. There's more disorderly conduct, vandalism and assault during football games than there there have been during all these encampments throughout the nation. Yet, and, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, finish your thought. No, no, I'm just saying that I, I just wanted you to take it from there in terms of what you witnessed in the encampments um, and, and this idea that it's anti-Semitic. And as you said, you're of Jewish background and there you were. I know a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Beinart, also attended the Columbia uh, encampment. Uh, another good friend of mine, David Myers, professor of Jewish history here at UCLA, um, was, at, was at the encampment and was trying to prevent the assault against them uh, uh, by these outside agitators uh, that were pro-genocide. So you you get a completely different picture when you visit versus what the media says. And I, I we all know that that was going to be the case anyway. But I just wanted you to 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 speak to your personal experience. And as as a uh, as a person whose family survived the Holocaust, or I'm sure people were uh, victims of the Holocaust, um, how you see these protests um, and and what they mean to you? Yes, and thank you for raising this issue, which I feel so deeply about. You know, my Jewish background um, and my grandparents had come here. Uh, fleeing pogroms. So my family had actually escaped before the Holocaust, but were very sympathetic to it because their, you know, their lives had been, you know, utterly destroyed. Uh, the children in their family, my my grandparents who fled here, they were being drafted into the Russian army at age five as part of these pogroms. So, you know, I grew up in a Jewish community outside of Chicago, going to uh, religious school once a week until I was age 15 and I was so-called convert confirmed, which is what you did and still do really in, in the uh, so-called reformed Jewish um, um you know, division. And this happened, you know, I grew up right after the Holocaust. So this was a major existential crisis for this community. How can people do this to each other? And how do we come to terms with that? And how we came to terms with it was by affirming that genocide would never happen again, not to anyone. And that genocide is the responsibility, not just of the perpetrator, but of the bystander. It is the responsibility of all of us not to allow genocide to happen to anyone. And I grew up with that so just um, ingrained into me, you know, that really set my course. I didn't expect that I would be witnessing a genocide, you know, that any of us would witness genocide, but it it really imbued in me a sense of social responsibility and kind of made me an activist uh, from the get-go. But I understood that it was a basic Jewish value to stop genocide. And when I see now people who are lifting up this message, which is also the message that Israel is conducting a genocide. This is the message of the International uh, Court of Justice. It is the message of the uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly, as well as the one um, uh, uh, resolution of the Security Council when the US uh, you know, finally uh, stood down for once. You know, the world agrees that this is a genocide, it's, it's a plausible genocide, but that's as close as you get to a genocide until it's too late. So you have to act. And that was really the mission of all of these bodies, the Arab League as well, you know, and the Muslim nations who are all saying that the flow of weapons to Israel must stop. 
And in fact, the um, the Arab League, if I understand correctly, they're calling for a, um, a peacekeepers, for there to be peacekeepers to basically stay the hand of this genocidal occupying army, which is acting in the most horrific way that I think we have witnessed, certainly in my lifetime. It's just staggering. Each incident seems more outrageous than the last. Now with the uh, the spigot being entirely closed off in Rafa for the past week, no water is getting in, no food is getting in. And you have these uh, Israeli mobs who are taking the uh, the aid from the trucks and destroying it and stomping on it with great joy. It's just inconceivable what is going on here, what kinds of monsters have been created, um, you know, which is how genocide happens. Genocide happens when people have been led to believe that there is some other monster that is threatening them. So this is following the textbook, um, you know, description of a genocide. And, you know, so it it just um, it makes it very hard for me as a person, uh, you know, dedicated to what I see as basic Jewish values to stop genocide. I cannot rest. I mean, I know all my Palestinian and Muslim friends cannot rest. We cannot rest and we cannot stop. We need to stop this. How can we make, <clears throat> excuse me, how can we make Joe Biden stop this? He has the power to stop this as uh, Ronald Reagan stopped Israel when Israel was slaughtering uh, people in Lebanon when they went to pursue the PLO, which was like the Hamas of its day, you know, and to say that, oh, Hamas is beyond redemption. We have to kill all, all Gazans to be sure, you know, really all Palestinians. We're going to kill all Palestinians. That's kind of their strategy here because, um, you know, because we have to stop Hamas. Well, that's kind of bullshit because, excuse, pardon my French, that's just, you know, uh, it's just outrageous that they are saying that because this has been the plan. There has been a plan of ethnic cleansing since, uh, since the get-go. And, you know, there were all sorts of historic documents that only became available in the 1990s. So people of my era grew up before this information was available. Of course, the Palestinians were always saying this, but, you know, the Israelis had a very different tune. Well, that tune changed in the 1990s when the Israeli historians for the first time had access to their own national archives to see that what the Palestinians were saying was absolutely true, that there was massacre upon massacre beginning even before the Nakba. Um, you know, there was the, uh, the, the blow up of the uh, Jerusalem hotel, uh, the, the, the uh, Camp David hotel. Where a hundred people, you know, were killed. This was a terrorist plot. There were terrorist plots upon terrorist plots in order to basically orchestrate an ethnic cleansing. So, you know, in my own feeling, we need to go back to the drawing boards here. There are so many uh, Zionists, basically, who've been sold a bill of goods and need to understand what the actual history is here and how we can. Uh, you know, take emergency measures right now to uphold Jewish values, you know, uh, Muslim values, religious values, human values. And I want to just also note that the super Orthodox rabbis, you know, who lived in Jerusalem, who lived there uh, in Palestine for centuries in peace, the problem, you know, they say themselves, everything was fine until the Zionists came with the intention to create conflict and to drive out the Palestinians. And they also drove out the Christians and they also drove out the religious Jews as well who didn't buy into this. And why didn't the religious Jews buy into it? In their words, and I'm quoting here from Miko Peled, who's writing a book about the super Orthodox um, uh, Jews living in Palestine, what they say is that it's that Zionism is anti-Jewish because, you ask them why, they say it violates the basic tenets uh, in the Ten Commandments, namely thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal. 
they've been witnesses to history here, and they're very much the victims of Zionism itself. So it's really important that we go back to the drawing boards. But in the meantime, we've got to stop this genocide. And given that Biden you know, is an absolute, what can I say, just warmonger and a war criminal, uh, a genocider, and maybe a bit of dementia thrown in there as well. You know, he's not going to do it. He really needs to be forced. Um, and I think one tool that is available to us right now is to get on the ballot in New York State and then to complete our ballot drive for him to know that he is going to be called out on the carpet in this election, that genocide, empire, and this um, assault really on American democracy and human rights, it is going to be front and center in this election. If we're on the ballot in New York, the American people are going to be unstoppable in this race. Dr. Jill Stein, uh, the 2024 presidential candidate for the Green Party, uh, I thank you. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly. I think we all agree. Uh, why don't we Muslims, we Jews, we Christians start living up to our own values uh, instead of weaponizing our faiths, weaponizing victimhood uh, to oppress the other? And, and if I could, sorry, yeah. and just to add, because I forgot to mention, if people would like to just, you know, put some boots on the ground here and make this happen in the next two weeks, it will be decided whether there is a national force to contest for power with the empire and the genocide. That's gonna get decided here in the next two weeks. If you can carry a petition, uh, you can join us. We will train you, we will show you how, we'll help you organize with your friends and neighbors. Uh, go to jillstein2024.com or you can go to the New York Green Party as well. Um, and, you know, and, and join with us, because if we stand up with the courage of our convictions, uh, like the students on campuses, and as you were saying, with the courage of and the uh, vision and the inspiration of all those who hold religious values or human values close to their heart, uh, we really are an unstoppable force. And, and this is this is the perfect storm. Thank you. Thank you so much for enriching this program. Uh, we, we've been talking to all candidates. We are we cannot endorse. We have to open up our, our channel to every candidate. So they're all welcome to, to join us, uh, but we're really glad that you accepted the invitation uh, and we wish you well. And I am sure that you have already um, made an impact in terms of changing the landscape you know, throughout America and the sacrifices you made in terms of being arrested and being abused, brutalized uh, during the protest. Uh, it just speaks to uh, your stature and, and your integrity. So we we really uh, pray for your continued success. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Goldstein. So okay. You. Take care. All best. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.